Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Bustamante, and this is 2.6 and 2.7 part two. So we're talking about how things enter and exit the membrane, or the cell really, through the cell membrane. And we've left off talking about uh, passive transport that did not require energy. So things just moved, we said, with the concentration gradient or from a high concentration to a low concentration. Active transport, on the other hand, is going to move things from a low concentration to a high concentration. That means we have to add energy. We have to have some source of energy. And when we're typically talking about cells, that source of energy is ATP. And it's going to require a membrane protein in most instances, except when we are about to see how we move big things in and out, if you will. Uh, but you'll notice in this little animation here, right, in order to move these pro, uh, little molecules, maybe some sort of glucose or something, some sort of sugar, we have to add this energy in order to get typically a shape change and move it inside of the cell, or rather from our low concentration to our high concentration. Another example of active transport is things called endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is going to engulf things and bring them in to the cell, uh, typically larger macromolecules, hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, things like this. Exocytosis, on the other hand, is going to bring things out of the cell or take things out of the cell. And we can see in our little animation here that um, this kind of looks like a, a vesicle, just a little circle of thing uh, that will either fuse with the membrane and bring it in or fuse with the membrane and allow those large macromolecules to be secreted outside of the cell. So there are a couple types of endocytosis. The first is phagocytosis, and we can kind of think of it as like cellular eating. Uh, it's an example of where you would maybe bring in like a food, uh, typically like a bacteria or something that's large in that instance. So something that it does uh, phagocytosis is white blood cells when they engulf bacteria to try and help your body fight uh, that, that bacteria that's inside of it. Pinocytosis is kind of like cellular drinking. It forms around fluids and brings those fluids into the cell. And then we have receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is kind of cool. It's much more specific. It's a form of pinocytosis for specific macromolecules. And you can see they have little receptors, say, on your cell membrane and receptors on whatever molecule you're trying to bring into the cell. And they kind of have to match up like a puzzle piece in order to fit and be brought in. It's much more efficient than pinocytosis and... Um, much more effective and selective as well because it's it's just more more ways to recognize it one way or another okay so remember endocytosis brings in exocytosis brings out i like to think exo exit the cell the last one i want to talk about today is an example of active transport and that's the famous sodium potassium pump and the sodium potassium pump is one that you should definitely understand and know what's happening so what the sodium potassium pump does is it either brings sodium or potassium inside and out of the cell but how do we know the sodium potassium pump is active transport well the sodium potassium pump uses atp so it's active transport and it uses a protein to span the membrane and we're going to see what a conformational change is and a conformational change is kind of just a fancy way for talking about a shape change so we're going to see that protein uh, change shape the other thing we need to know about the pro sodium potassium pump is that it goes against the concentration gradient so things are going to move from a low concentration to a high concentration so in our first part here we're going to see that there is sodium typically on the outside of the cell and potassium, or excuse me, and sodium on the inside of the cell as well. We're going to see that these molecules exchange back and forth. And in the first part here, I'm going to back it up just a little bit. We notice that these sodium and potassium are on both sides again, but three sodium ions are going to bond from the inside of the cell. That means inside of the cell, there's a low concentration of sodium. So they're going to bond specifically in this channel protein. And we have to add ATP. 
Here's ATP here. In a second, you're going to notice that we're going to lose everything but one of the phosphate groups. That means we're going to give off ADP, and we're going to be left with one phosphate here. That uh, giving of the energy causes what we say is our conformational change and opens up that sodium to the outside of the cell. Now that sodium is going to release to the outside of the cell where there's a high concentration of sodium ions. Because we've changed our conformation, now we're going to want to see our potassium or K plus ions. They're going to bond and we're going to see that when they bond, that phosphate that was left there releases and we saw another conformational change of our protein. So now we're going to release these two potassium ions back into the cell, creating a higher concentration of sodium in the cell. And uh, it's really important, this creates charges across the membrane that's important for moving things and sending signals back and forth. So yes, you should understand the sodium potassium pump. You should understand that we move three sodium out and two potassium into the cell. And you should be able to explain how that is active transport, how it's an example, and what a conformational change is. Also, how we change ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into adenosine diphosphate, two of them, and why that allows the protein to work. I hope this was helpful. Have a great day.